This commitment to, to uh, the American dream is in name only. I would say we're in unprecedented, uncharted territory uh, in terms of first off economic inequality. Uh, we have a level of, 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 of income inequality in the United States that's as high as was the case at the very peak of the first Gilded Age. It's not very smart to give all the growth to the top 1%. Uh, I would say two, two possibilities, we, and we have to choose one of these two if we want, to, if we want to, to repair the current state of affairs. We can either engage in radical redistribution or in radical decommodification. We have to do one or the other. If we don't do either, then, then, then uh, the American dream will be, will be something that's trotted out every four years uh, for, 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 for good political speak, but it will mean nothing. Uh, I just wondered about your impressions of uh, uh, how it's changing, uh, where we started, wh where it's moving now, and what, what you might see for the future of inequality and mobility research. I think some of the developments are wholly methodological in nature, uh, but nonetheless are, are important. And I think the, the main methodological development of late is the rise of administrative data. Uh, and it offers uh, opportunities that simply were not possible with, with, with conventional survey data. And I'll list just a few of them. Uh, we can examine, as most notably Raj Chetty already has, we can examine uh, uh, differences in, in, in mobility at very detailed spatial levels that, that have revealed in the case of economic mobility that there's so much variability in the U.S. alone uh, that the amount of variability in the U.S. swamps that that we see in the, in the, in the world uh, across, across countries. Uh, you mean like from state to state or? Or, or even at a lower level. Even, okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's one, spatial detail. Uh, two, um, uh, one can carry out analyses across detailed subpopulations. So I'll give you an example. I'm now working with uh, a group of folks on linked uh, census and American community survey data, which allows us to study occupational mobility. But we have so many cases that we can examine differences in mobility across about 60 racial and ethnic groups. And even within the so-called white group, we, 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 can, we, can, we can examine whether or not there, there are substantial, substantial differences across different ethnic, 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 ethnic groups. Uh, so that's the second advantage, subpopulations that, that we want to see whether or not they're living up to the so-called American dream. Uh, we simply have not been able to do that given, given the sample sizes that are available in conventional surveys. With administrative data, we can now finally evaluate the extent to which the American dream is in play for, for particular subpopulations. Here's the third advantage. With administrative data, it will be possible to bring together the analysis of economic occupation and education mobility. Again, we didn't have the cases to do that uh, with, with, with conventional surveys. Uh, but with administrative data, uh, we, can, uh, we can now bring together fields that were very artificially separate. We're kind of balkanized in, into, into different disciplines. Uh, but, but there's no reason for that to be. Uh, and, and, and then with these data, you can, for example, examine trade-offs. So I've long thought that we've overestimated the amount of mobility because we simply examined it with respect to one dimension, economic or occupational. Uh, but some people are making trade-offs. So you might say, well, I'll suffer a bit of downward mobility on the economic front in exchange for getting the kind of occupation that I want. Uh, and so it looks like there's lots of, say, in this case, downward mobility in terms of the economic dimension. But really, it's just a trade-off that's being made. Mm -hmm. And that if you took the full picture into account, you'd see that, that, that in fact, it's just an expression of a, of, of a type of reproduction that's now manifested in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's another payoff. So these are all methodological payoffs. Uh, I can talk. Yeah, but it also sounds like they're having substantive payoffs, yeah. each one. Yeah, let me give you another example. We do not know the extent to which there's been a fundamental historic change in, in, the, in, in, in the effects of mothers as opposed to fathers in, in occupational reproduction. How can we not know that? We don't know that because we don't have the data uh, to tease out the net effects of, of, of mothers and fathers. Uh, but with administrative data and with the samples that it, that, it, that it makes possible, we can, for the first time, examine you mean, that. You mean the separate effects of mother's occupation and father's occupations on the children's? Or? That's right. No. And mother's income and father's income, uh -huh. mother's education and father's education. Uh -huh. uh, 
all of these forces are likely at work at once, and yet we haven't had the capacity to tease them out. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fairly demanding on the data, right? All right. Uh, are there big organizational, have you encountered organizational software, just uh, 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 administrative problems, and the shift from doing research on so small, manageable data sets to these massive administrative data, set, data sets. Uh, everybody's talking about big data, but you've had some experience with it. What's, uh, uh, what's the experience? Has it been pretty good or pretty easy, or are there some problems to solve still? I think there are huge problems to solve. And here's, here's what I would nominate as the number one problem, and that's access to administrative data you know, on a wider basis than is now the case. Uh, we now have one-off deals that are individually negotiated, uh, uh, that are time-consuming to negotiate, and that don't expose administrative data to the full, to the to the to the full analyses. That, that, that I mean, these are public data; they are data that are collected with taxpayer dollars. Uh, they are our data; they're the people's data, uh, and we should be able to use them to ascertain whether or not we're living up to our most profound commitments, to determine whether or not our, our, our programs and institutions and policies are working as intended. And yet, it is extremely difficult to get access. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think the United States is, is, is losing out in a competition with other countries that have access to these sorts of data, losing out in a competition to evaluate its programs and assess whether or not it's living up to its commitment. So, so we all lose by virtue of making access so, 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 so difficult. Of course, now, that said, the access has to be under very, very uh, 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 secure circumstances in which we know that, that there will be no, no breaches. Hmm. Uh, uh, but we know how to do that. Uh, and the record has been, been, been uh, uh, very, very good. Yeah, all we need is one case of somebody. That's right. Uh, and we're in trouble. <laughs> and we're in trouble. That's right. And so we have to make sure there is not even that one case. No mm -hmm. Equifax when it comes to, to public administrative data. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has to be, that has to be our, our, our highest priority because so much is at stake. Mm -hmm. But I, we know how to do that and the record is good. And I think that because we know how to do it, we should, we should move deliberately toward, 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 toward providing access in, in, in in the secure environments that already exist okay. in, a, in a broader way and exploiting the data for, 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 for all they can deliver. Okay. So once you get access it's the, um, and have those protections, then we know what to do with those data or are there new problems that you've encountered or uh, uh, is it mainly an access problem right now, at least in the U.S.? I think there are new opportunities of, of all sorts. I talked a bit about them with respect to, right. to mobility, but I'll, I'll give you one more example of the, of the opportunities that's more on the causal side as opposed to the descriptive. Uh, and, and what makes big data so promising and exciting in part is that it opens up all sorts of quasi-experimental opportunities. Uh, so the causal inference that you can secure uh, uh, in, in many cases is profound. So for example, you might have a, a, a particular program uh, that gets rolled out across uh, uh, different uh, regions in, in, in a very random way. Uh, and so you can exploit that randomness to get inferences about the effects of that program. Or there might be an event uh, like a, a, a plant closing that, that um, uh, leads to someone, lo lots of folks losing their jobs, not because of anything that could be associated with their human capital, but is rather is truly an exogenous shock. And so then you can get an effect mm -hmm. of, say, moving uh, mm -hmm. that, 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 uh, that uh, is truly, truly causal. Uh, so there's all sorts of opportunities of that sort that, that open up and allow us to become much more confident about a causal inference. Uh, but you need a lot of data so that you'll be there, as it were, yeah. when these things happen. Uh -huh. uh, and so that's, I think, another very exciting opportunity. Uh -huh. That's great. We've had great. this huge growth in inequality in this country especially, but more broadly probably also. Um, I wonder what's that impact on, on, uh, on mobility and on, uh, uh, on an American dream? 
Um, want to have lots of absolute mobility, it's not very smart to give all the growth to the top 1%. Uh, uh, they will do better than their parents, uh -huh. likely, but for the rest of the 99%, uh, mm -hmm. that type of distribution of growth is not going to optimize absolute mobility. So I think it's pretty clear that with respect to absolute economic mobility, rising income inequality is very destructive. So that's just one example. Well, but Maybe it'd be good to talk a little bit about your own personal efforts here. I know that uh, uh, you've founded, I think, a couple of interdisciplinary inequality uh, uh, research institutes. Uh, uh, you are a co-editor of Pathways, which is designed to bring some of academic research out into a larger uh, 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 a larger arena. Um, what's been your experience with both with Pathways and with, with this effort to try to make sociology more public sociology or indeed academia more public academia and have having a good Im impact on the policy process? Yeah. Well, I guess I think it's part of our obligation to have, uh, again, what Michelle Jackson refers to in the Pathways piece as two conversations that are happening at once. And this is what Pathways is supposed to be about. So the first conversation is about how we can make uh, incremental changes to, to our existing uh, programs and institutions that are immensely important. Mm -hmm. And that sociologists should be right there in the mix. Uh, but we've often, I think, withdrawn from those everyday policy questions and left them to, say, most notably economists, when we have a lot to offer. Uh, and I think we're getting back in the mix uh, and, and, and understanding that those, those everyday policy questions like what's the effect of the minimum wage or, or to what extent is the earned income tax credit having payoffs in terms of, of maternal health or child health, those sorts of everyday policy questions that are immensely important in making decisions about, mm -hmm. about, about what sorts of investments we should make, we're back in the mix there increasingly, and I think that's really important. That's we ought good. not withdraw to the academy. No. Uh, so that's the first kind of conversation. It's a really important conversation about, about, about whether or not our existing policies are working well. But there's a second conversation. Again, I'm drawing on the work of, of this piece in, by Michelle Jackson in, in, in Pathways. A second mm -hmm. conversation uh, about bolder change, uh, not just reform, but, but, but big institutional change. We need to have that conversation too, and that's what Pathways is about as well. What it's kinds of things are, are possibilities there that we ought to be at least thinking about? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go there. <laughs> um, I think we should be thinking about radical experiments with, with desegregation, both economic and racial. Uh, uh, I, I think there is nothing more un-American than, than living separately as we now do. And, and that we ought to, we ought to, to, to commit in a wholehearted way to experimenting with how we can end this, this mm -hmm. increasing, for example, economic segregation. Uh, I think so many of the problems that we see with respect to, to inequality and poverty arise because we live in a deeply segregated world. Uh, uh, and we ought to live together. So we don't uh, talk to each other. We don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. We don't understand each other. I think it's much more than talking and understanding, but that's important. Uh, so that, that's one, one bold experiment in desegregation that we ought to undertake. Uh, uh, I think we should, we should undertake some bold experiments in, in uh, redistribution. Uh, I, we're working with uh, Y Combinator Research to, to deliver uh, uh, the, the basic income experiment. Uh, in the administrative infrastructure. That's one little thing that we can do to help them. Uh, but that's an example of a bold experiment in radical redistribution, and I think mm -hmm. we should do more of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll give you a third. I think we should undertake a lot of bold experiments in what I would call decommodification. That is, huh. we're increasingly putting things on the market and allocating things according to the market mechanism. Uh, and, and I think We've had some reversals in that larger tendency, and I think health healthcare is one such reversal of of late under under the Obama administration. But I think we can. But experiment. it's still incremental. That's not a. Uh, I mean, when you compare the, I mean, what Obama was after, which is really uh, 
taking the existing structure and just adding to it a little bit more. It's not a not going to you know, uh, universal uh, health care. Fair enough. Um, and I think we should, we should have an, a very open, and we're starting to have that conversation, and I think it's great, about, about mm-hmm. even more radical reforms within health care. But we ought to also think about decommodifying in other domains. Such as? I would say, for example, uh, uh, early childhood education, child care. Uh, these are domains that once were actually uh, services that were delivered in the, in the family, right? They weren't, they weren't on the market. Then they were put basically on the market and you have to pay for high quality child care. You have to pay for high quality early childhood education. Mm-hmm. We know they're immensely consequential. They're on the market. And mm-hmm. so parents who have the capacity to pay for it can mm-hmm. buy that opportunity for their kids. We ought to think about, mm-hmm. we ought to think about taking that back mm-hmm. and decommodifying it and delivering it as a, as a, as a public good. Um, and, uh, uh, and then lastly, sorry, uh, jobs. Okay. We have declining prime age employment. We should think about public jobs as a way to deal with that. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So I think there's a lot of bold decommodifying experiments that we all should undertake. How about housing? I mean, uh, 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 there's still a lot of homelessness in this country, still a lot of evictions and rentals. And is that part of the policy mix we ought to be looking at? Or? Absolutely, yeah. Uh-huh. I, I think that's another uh-huh. arena in which we ought to think much more boldly. It's, it's a travesty that we are unwilling, and again, I'm drawing on Michelle Jackson's work here, unwilling to own up to how big the problem is and recognize that it will require uh, a big response. That's great. That's great.